if you are developing softwares before the term serverless came into picture you know how hard it is to maintain servers and manage them with the recent advancements in the cloud computing ecosystem serverless is one of the major contributions for some innovative solutions in this video we are going to see what is serverless computing and overlay that with some of the use cases with which we create our application architectures this is the agenda for the session initially we are going to see what is serverless and how did it evolve later we are going to see the serverless offerings from major cloud providers post that we'll be looking at different use cases for example batch processing applications web applications event driven applications which we can develop using the serverless cloud offerings in one of the cloud platform i'll be using aws as the cloud platform while explaining these use cases however during the serverless offerings i'll compare the different offerings provided by the other cloud providers as well finally we will end the session with the future of serverless and the road ahead so that we can take it forward if you already know what is serverless and if you are using serverless in your day to day life do let me know in the comment section below also if you have any challenging use cases with respect to serverless i would like to hear from you The name serverless itself is a misnomer. Serverless is generally made of servers and people think serverless doesn't have servers. Essentially we need a server to run our compute. The only difference is we don't see the compute and we don't manage them because we don't essentially create them ourselves. However, you still need a server to run your compute. So why is it called serverless then? Serverless is essentially a managed offering which is provided by different cloud providers. Imagine you are in a cloud provider or you are using a platform which could be providing some cloud offerings for serverless. In this case let's say I have a mobile application. I have my cloud provider who is having lot of servers. I'm not essentially renting anything right now, but I have a mobile application which I have pushed into an app store and people are using the mobile application. Now the moment a request comes from the mobile application to my backend I don't essentially have my servers started or imagine that I don't have any server up and running in the backend. However, based on the usage of my application, I provision these servers instantaneously. And if I need to process anything with respect to maintaining a state, I can use a relational database or a NoSQL database. Imagine more users are using this particular application and I get more volume. In a traditional cloud computing paradigm, we will have to configure the auto scaling capability on how many machines we need to provision or how much load can our application withstand. However, in the serverless offering, scalability is added by default. So if there are more loads, there will be more instances of my machines and the applications so that I don't have to manually configure them when I create my application because the complete ownership of provisioning these machines is taken care by the cloud platform. Obviously more compute means more data. If we need to scale our database, we should be able to scale that as well. So it's not just with respect to scaling the application or the compute. It also is with respect to scaling our data. Most of these are provided by the cloud platforms already. However, we need to have these compute and the databases up and running always so that we can serve our clients. Imagine a pricing model where people come back and say you can have your application deployed but don't pay me if nobody is using it. That's where serverless computing is placed. So the major features of the serverless paradigm is the event triggers. Based on my incoming request, my instances were provisioned instantaneously. So based on a trigger, my compute has been provisioned and once the compute has been provisioned, I was able to scale by default. So scalability is provided in the serverless offering by default and this is managed by the cloud provider. So I don't have to manually maintain these servers and I don't have to bring them up and bring them down because these are by default taken care by the cloud platform. And if there are no triggers, obviously there is no compute running. So I don't have to pay. So the pricing model is also tied up with these factors 
and you will be able to pay only for the request and the time of compute which you are running obviously every technology comes with its pros and cons there are a lot of things which we need to consider before getting into serverless computing world the major ones are cold start time we need to have our application which should be able to start instantaneously if the vendor is going to provide our underlying compute and if he starts the application we should be able to immediately serve the request based on the triggers which we get so the cold start time should be reduced so we should have a faster startup time the next one is event based triggers not every application can react to events there could be synchronous applications however you need to make sure that your application is event based and stateless and it is cloud vendor based so if you are creating a serverless architecture you cannot use the same architecture in every cloud platform you need to use the corresponding cloud platforms offering so if you are integrating with aws you might not be able to easily lift and shift into other platforms because the other platforms might have similar offerings but with a different product so you might have to work with these vendor specific products so it is vendor based most of the time now what are the different serverless offerings provided by the different cloud platforms so i am picking up the three major ones the aws cloud google cloud platform and the microsoft azure cloud platform serverless evolved into popularity with the introduction of function as a service the first offering which came as a function as a service was from amazon and it was called aws lambda the same offering is available in the other cloud platforms in the name as cloud functions and azure cloud functions however it is just a part of the serverless offering because it's functions as a service you can run a particular function as a service and it also falls into the serverless ecosystem because you don't have to keep on running your compute to execute this particular function the next predominant one is the container based serverless offering amazon provides something called aws fargate using which you can have serverless containers running on elastic container service or elastic kubernetes service so amazon provides two container service and the container service which is their proprietary and the kubernetes service and you can use fargate to schedule your containers on these based on your events google cloud provides something called cloud run using which you can run containers in a serverless mode so it can spin off a new container from a docker image based on the event it could be a http event or a event from a queue the same applies to the azure cloud platform there is something called azure cloud instances which can be triggered based on events and again these are all purely serverless there are also other offerings which are provided by these cloud platforms these include the aws glue app engine from google cloud azure app engine cloud tasks from google cloud and amazon provides tons of managed services which can be leveraged as a serverless offering because you will be charged only when you use it and you don't have to worry about the scalability factor because the platform is going to take care of that also kubernetes being the recent platforms as a platform it provides something called knative knative is a serverless offering over kubernetes you can run containers based on events and you can have knative deployed in your on prem because you might have deployed your kubernetes clusters within that and knative is like a layer over the kubernetes cluster and you can use knative to serverlessly create and destroy containers based on your need with that i hope you understand what is serverless and what are the different cloud offerings in order to explain the use cases i'm going to pick up aws as our primary cloud provider imagine that i am an aws developer and i'm going to develop applications which are purely serverless and i want to understand some of the use cases hence i'm going to use the aws cloud platform the first use case which we are going to see is a batch processing application so these could be processing huge files and then storing data into a data warehouse since we are going to use a serverless architecture let's imagine that we are going to use the aws cloud platform to create a batch processing application imagine that i have huge file which is an end of day processing file based on my transactions which has happened within the application so this particular use case is to get this end of day file process it and store it in a data warehouse so that if somebody asks me for historical transaction information i should be able to query my data warehouse or a data lake to give it back to the user so this use case can help us in a classic implementation of a serverless framework because the end of day file which i'm going to get may not be available throughout the day and i'll be getting it only at a particular time or maybe whenever my previous batch or system creates this particular file 
imagine that this particular file is pushed onto my S3 object store where I have a bucket and every day a file comes into this particular bucket and after processing this file I need to archive the file as well and I need to store this into a data lake. So once the file arrives to my object store I can get an event notification and based on the event notification I want to create let's say a EMR cluster. In order to create an EMR cluster I can leverage AWS glue which can do serverless with my batch processing system because I need to have an EMR cluster which has spark jobs which can process this particular file and persist into a data lake. Since the file size is huge I am going to use spark jobs in order to read this particular file and then process them and store them. And finally after the job has been completed I need to archive my file. So I am going to leverage the lambda for that particular purpose. So once the EMR clusters have finished their job processing which is basically reading a file, processing them and then just storing it in a data lake. I am going to send an event to trigger a lambda function and the lambda function is going to take the file in S3 and then mark it as Glazier so that it can be archived and we can retrieve Glazier whenever we want after a while because, the, because we don't have to have huge files in the S3 bucket and we can archive it so that we can save a lot of cost by moving it into Glazier. So if you look at it the AWS glue offering is completely serverless. Based on the file arrival, I'm going to create a cluster. And this happens only when the file is available. If the file is not available, my cluster is not going to be created. And once the cluster is created, I'm going to read the file, finish the job by persisting everything into a data lake. And I'm going to trigger a lambda to move this particular file from the bucket into an archival state so that I can save on my cost on the file storage as well. So here I'm saving two things. One is the compute cost because I'm going to create a cluster only when I require it and I'm going to move my file into a glazier option where I can archive it. So I will be saving cost in both these ends. However, still I will have the data lake which is not a serverless right now because I have huge amount of data in it. But I'm going to pay only for my data lake I'm I'm not going to pay for my cluster. This is a classic example of a batch processing application. If let's say I don't want to use AWS glue and I want to use AWS batch because I don't have huge volume and I have very less volume and I don't want to create a cluster in order to persist into a data lake but I have my own MySQL database which is Amazon Aurora DB and I want to use a serverless offering there as well then you can go for AWS batch the entry point is the same I get a file but based on the file I'll be triggering AWS batch which is again a managed service offering from Amazon which can trigger a batch based on the file and read the file process it and then persist into Aurora instance now after processing the file I need to archive the file from S3 bucket. In order to do that I can leverage the CloudWatch event trigger to trigger a scheduled event based on the AWS batch completion and once an event is raised from the CloudWatch event it can trigger a lambda and the lambda can now archive the file. So this is another use case of using serverless offerings within the cloud provider to create a batch processing application. Now let's look at how to create a web application by leveraging the serverless offering. Imagine the website is techprimers.com and I have it hosted in AWS. So let's see how I would design the web application so that I can serve my requests to the clients. So imagine somebody from the browser is hitting techprimers.com that will hit my CloudFront servers. I have my static file stored inside a S3 bucket so that geographically my users are able to load the website faster because all my images are stored inside the S3 bucket and CloudFront is distributing my static files via its CDN. So CDNs are content delivery networks and CloudFront is the Amazon version of the CDN. And I have my static files from S3. Imagine somebody is loading techprimers.com and I have static files. It just gets from the S3 bucket and then it just provides that to the user. So if you look at it, I don't have any compute involved here. However, let's say one part of the website needs to dynamically retrieve something and I have to run some logic which is in Node.js. So in order to get the Node.js code, I have created a Node.js Lambda which I have deployed in my server side. However, only when the user clicks that particular category or a feature from the techprimers.com, this particular Lambda needs to be triggered. And once the user clicks that particular feature, the request from the cloud form needs to come into the Lambda. So how can I achieve that? I can achieve that using an API gateway which can act as an interface within the Lambda and the API gateway creates a trigger to the Lambda. And this is a HTTP trigger which I am going to trigger from the CloudFront 
into the lambda however i need to have it secured so i'm going to use the amazon cognito for securing this particular endpoint along with the data retrieval from the dynamo db so the lambda is going to retrieve the data from the dynamo db dynamically and serve to the cloudfront distribution and it is secured via cognito and the lambda is triggered using a api gateway so i don't have to worry about how many people are going to use techprimers.com because my lambda is a managed service and amazon will scale it up and down based on the need and if people are not going to use the dynamic feature inside the website and i won't be charged because my lambdas won't be triggered until or unless somebody uses that particular feature so this is a classic example of how we can use lambdas or serverless architecture for creating a web application moving on to the final use case on how to create event driven applications imagine i have a newsletter subscription which people have subscribed to using a web application so imagine this particular use case 4 was to subscribe to a newsletter so people have leveraged my api gateway lambda to subscribe to my newsletters and now how am i going to send these to the user so i'm going to use the event driven architecture so in order to do that I'm going to get the data from the database because data uh, is already present in my database. So in order to trigger the newsletter publishing, I'm going to send my newsletters every week. So I have created a scheduler inside my CloudWatch scheduler saying, please trigger my Lambda every week. So CloudWatch trigger will create an event and invoke a Lambda, which is going to retrieve the data from the DynamoDB, which is persisted already. So people have subscribed to my TechPrimers newsletter the data is present in the DynamoDB. Now my Lambda is going to retrieve these information and this is just going to retrieve the information. It doesn't know what it needs to. So this Lambda, whatever I have created for retrieving information from the database will retrieve it and publish to another Lambda which can send email notification. Now how can I achieve it? So I can use queues to publish the messages over the queue and the other lambda can pick it up and then send email notifications so if let's say there are thousand people so my lambda will read the database get the thousand users create messages and push it onto the queue and it will die the other lambda gets messages from the queue based on the trigger from the queue and it will send email notifications so this way i am using two different serverless option which are the lambdas two different lambdas but i am leveraging existing services which is inside amazon here i am leveraging these CloudWatch event scheduler, the SQS queue, and also the SNS email notification so that I can achieve my use case. Let's say I want to trigger my notification lambda whenever I can ad hocly trigger. So if you look at this particular architecture, it works only from the start. So if an event is triggered, then the event goes and triggers a lambda that pulls the message from the database and then creates a request for the next lambda. Let's say I want to trigger the second lambda in an ad hoc fashion. I cannot do with this kind of an architecture. So I can remove the queue and I can add an API gateway and I can trigger this API gateway whenever I want. For example, I want to do an ad hoc newsletter trigger. Then I can directly trigger my API gateway to push notifications based on the user list which I'm providing. Or I can even place the API gateway in front of the this particular lambda to trigger everything. In this case, I'm just showing you how you can use API gateways or queues to have different lambdas talk with each other. So the same can be achieved in any cloud platform. If you're using the Google Cloud, you can leverage the corresponding version of the Google provided offering and you can still achieve the serverless architecture. Now, what is the road ahead for us? If you know about the CNCF landscape, the cloud native landscape, this particular image is coming from landscape.cncf.io and you can take a look at this particular image. It's basically covering what are the different tools which are available for different categories for example right from tooling till the installable platform you can leverage these tools learn them and use them whenever you are creating serverless architectures as day by day the serverless framework is getting evolved you might be able to see more and more tools getting added to this particular cloud native landscape once most of these tools are hardened and they are available for people to use if you personally ask me how is the future for the serverless architectures? I would say serverless is going to be the future because most of us would like to save cost in running compute. So for us, serverless plays a major role in achieving these by leveraging the cloud native platform capabilities with reducing the cost. I hope you learned something new. As always, if you like the video, go ahead and like it. 
if you haven't subscribed to the channel go ahead and subscribe to it meet you again in the next video thank you very much